Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Next Generation's First Generation. I am your host, Sasha Shouties, and we got Pat with us, too. Hey, everybody. Yay. So, Pat, what episode are we watching today? We're watching the 11th episode of the fifth season of Star Trek The Next Generation. Ooh. Uh, that's called Hero Worship. Mm-hmm. That's where we got little Timmy wants to become a, a big data. And not well, the band. Yeah, would have been a better name for this than, uh, than Hero Worship. <laughs> okay, so what we'd like you folks to do is go ahead and sync up your device. We'll give you the countdown 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So are you ready? Here it comes. 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. We're warping along. They lost contact with the starship Vico. Exploring the black cluster. They probably got bad directions. It's weird that they would just name something like that. It's like the black hole of Calcutta or darkest Africa almost. <laughs> but man, the HD on this is what? Is it is it locked in? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once again, we have the same ensign up front, and I believe this is her last appearance. She was in the previous two episodes. Yes, that is correct. I had a name for her. What is her name? Ensign Schmitzen. Jennifer Schmitzen. There's also another uh, background character, a Harley Venton. That's the actor's name as Hutchinson, and he is our transporter chief. Yes, no O'Brien in this episode. Yeah, he was probably off doing something fun. Non-contract day, guys. Sorry. Well, so they maintained an Indian movie career the whole time he was in Star Trek. So. Hmm. So the vessel, the vessel is adrift. And we're just going to beam some folks onto it to see what happened. Now you'd think that with something this messed up, as messed up as this, it would be all data. And we don't really see that he could be used that way until. Uh, well, it does make sense movie. to. It does make sense to have a data in this environment where. Yeah. It's hostile to people, um, so you can send something in that that's not uh, going to be affected by adverse environments. Uh, oh, there's a dead crew member with a handful of glass. It's funny because I um, I still think of the data as a utility, and the people around him really do think of him as a person who can learn, even though he has to constantly remind them that he is, that he's an Android. And well, in the, in the episodes where they point out he's an Android, his general acting is typically more jerky. Mm -hmm. You know, like he'll do these more random head movements and eye blinks. And now we've just watched an episode with, Worf being very distant to a child who belongs to him. Data is now going to be used as, I mean, speaking of utilities, he's going to be kind of a therapy proxy for this kid that they find here. Oh, he almost becomes a family member, to tell you the truth. A little bit. I do like that they remain friends, but there's still a little bit of a whiff of, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay now. Can I still come, uh, come pet the dog that, you know, helped me through the trauma? This is a neat little device. The OGN. Just a portable battery. Yeah. It's nice oh. to see it on subtitle because I always thought it was a word like, I think I've said this before, O D E O N. Or O D I O N, Odeon. Mm -hmm. Like a Nickelodeon, which is not spelled I O N. No, it is not. Uh, 
but it's just the letters O, D, and N. I wonder what it stands for. That's a good question. Optical data network? Ooh. Maybe. Maybe. I bet you if we took the time to do some quick Googling, we'd find it quite quickly. But that's not the point of the show. The point of the show is to look at squished children and remember how it felt like when we were a kid. And I tell you, he looks really squished right there. In and fact, I, go ahead. I think that Data probably had his fans like this that were, you know, ultra nerds that wanted to be just like Data. I mean, Spock had, Spock had them and um, Data has them. And Worf did, you know, Worf in our previous episode has those fans too. But it's funny to see, like, you get, like, a little kid for Worf that's very, that doesn't act, like, very Klingon the other than that he growls sometimes. Mm -hmm. But here you have somebody that, you know, looks, looks more or less like, you know, the nerd in your Dungeons and Dragons group that <laughs> just wants to, you know, wants to fall in line and be as androidy as he can. Yeah, I, you know, I'm. You got me thinking about the fans of Star Trek, and um, one of the things I wish I had observed when I went to a Star Trek convention is to see which camp uh, the participants were in. For example, when I went, I was very much in the Picard camp, and that's kind of the mindset I had when I talked to people. It was usually Picard questions and whatnot, and also Patrick Stewart was a a guest speaker at this particular star trek con um but i'm sure there uh it'd be kind of neat if we had people like uh okay everybody who's a data fan stand over here everybody who's a war fan, fan stand over there and and just see if we could like get some kind of activity based off of of which fanboy you are yeah um, like, like like you could almost have like Worf's calisthenics class well they have I don't know if it still exists, but I, I had known of a group called Geordie's Engineers, which was a Star Trek fan for um, non-sighted kids. Mm -hmm. That that roughed up ship looks beautiful, by the way. That's I, that's one thing I always really got me excited as a little kid and watching this show was the damage, the, the attention to detail on the models. Or even when they pulled the cover plates off of like maintenance junctions and hatches and whatnot, and you could see all the guts inside. They're really lucky that beam didn't just collapse while the child was dematerialized. Like what's holding it up if, if he's removed? I think it's, it's stuck. I don't think... It's stuck on top of him. I think they would have accounted for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, Data just, he sussed it out. Okay, you guys go back to the ship. I'm going to do a, a hero mama lift. Yep. Actually, Data just doesn't want anybody to hear him crack a fart if he lifts something really heavy. <laughs> wonder if he does, if he, if he does get gas build up inside of it. Because he well, does, technically, he does breathe. Oh, yeah, this is directed by Patrick Stewart. Mm hmm. Good old Patty Stew. So, this is one of those moments where if you were this kid, you would remember every detail yep. of, of, data and lifting this beam and he's observing data's behavior right here and data is being superhuman and he is having no emotion and also this kid thought he deserved to die yeah but we find out that he's he's young enough that i think what my Head canon for this is that when he was littler, he was messing with a panel, and one of his parents jokingly said, 
don't mess with those. You'll blow up the whole ship. <laughs> and then one day he fell on one and the ship blew up and he thought that he did it. Yep. I've run into kids like that though, growing up where they were just had these super strict parents and something went wrong and it, it kind of fell, as you would say, it, it kind of fell in line with their head cannon of, of, well, I, I did this and my parents said it would respond this way. So it must be my fault. Yeah. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but they had one of the, those famous transporter just barely made it instances where you have your people transporting out and while they're transporting a beam will fall on top of them or like a phaser blast will go through them or one of those in the nick of time mm -hmm. cinema uh, cinematic effects so here we reveal the lie that the ship was boarded and i'm i'm wondering why troy doesn't pick up on the lie because he's a, he's in because his trauma is so extreme she can't suss that out or she might just know that because he's gone through trauma he's having a hard time understanding what's what's real well they say later on she can't read it oh they're talking about the engineering of of how this ship was ripped apart Oh, Mr. Patrick Stewart. So you say he directed this episode. Yes, he yeah. did. I wonder if this was the first one he directed. I'm not I, sure. I, I don't remember any others uh, that were directed by him prior. Yeah, maybe not. Um, he might have directed Captain's Holiday. I don't know why I have it in my head that he directed that. I do know that um, on the sixth day of recording this episode, this is when the cast found out that uh, Gene Roddenberry had passed away and they were sad. Marina Sirtis's father as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, same, same day, 10 year anniversary. And the joke was who treated her better? Yeah. So as kids' shows go, was, we've seen a number of them now. Uh, we saw a Disaster, and we've seen, well, just the previous one with, with Baby Wharf. And we've got this one here. And we've got that other episode where, where the kid's mom stepped on a mine and the alien, uh, the alien ghosts decided to take care of him. You remember that one, too? We had the, uh, the Riker and the Little Boy episode. Which mm, I think is the best. Too. Oh, and um, Picard and Wesley trapped on the planet together. Mm -hmm. So as little kid episodes, uh, how do you think this one kind of falls into the mix? I don't love this one. I think it had a, the germs of a million good ideas inside of it that never um, paid off. Uh, this is a great conversation, though. Um. Data wants to hear from Jordy about what it was like when one time when he was scared, which is a great way to um, to foster empathy. And Jordy tells him the story of he got separated from his parents very quickly before he could, before he had his visor, and it really freaked him out. And you know it's relatable even for sighted people. That idea that like if you you know if you were very very small. And your safety net just disappeared. Uh, and LeVar Burton does a great job of, you know, doing this whole dramatic moment. And Jordy doesn't get a ton of the, a ton of these. He really doesn't. If anything, he's pulling his reading rainbow acting skills right here. He does not. And also, I was going to say, of all of the cast of this. He doesn't ever get to do anything with, um, I don't think he ever acts with a, with a kid. And you'd think he would because he's the host of Reading Rainbow. Oh, there's some kids. More children. Well, I mean, that children. was a show that had like kid co-hosts on it or anything, but he would, 
this class this class that he's in is just it's just terrible it's like the worst sub in the world Mm -hmm. he's like i'm gonna leave this toy here where and i love that he's like this kid is not causing a disruption or anything and he has to know he's like going through a trauma he's all like hey man um you, you don't get to build with blocks. Like, that'd be one thing if he was distracting the other kids, but he's not. Like, what's actually happening is the teacher is signaling, is singling this kid out. Mm-hmm. And then he just looks concerningly at Troy. Obviously, this guy is not a teacher. I, you know, if he, if, if I were that teacher and I knew that kid was going through something, honestly, I'd let him do whatever he wants as long as it's not bothering the other kids. That's exactly what you do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't. You don't. You don't have to condone it, but you also don't need to uh, to put it down. Because yeah, singling him out is about the worst thing they can do. And Troy is not helping by just. Oh yeah, there's this window. It's not even two way glass. I just sit here and observe the kids. You know, I honestly think that Troy is an enabler sometimes of some really poor decisions when it comes to people in this show. I agree. Uh, Here we go. So I find it interesting that Picard and Data pick up on the ship is attacked hypothesis pretty quick when the only proof is the hearsay of a kid. Um, Whereas Jordy says, oh, wait, 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 look at the evidence the the nobody was nobody beamed on uh none of the entry points were forced that's jordy though whoa slow down yeah uh but i do like that i think this is the first mention of the bream uh second actually i hate to disappoint the first one came up in the loss ah yes but we don't see the bream until deep space nine Oh, man, I tell you, I wish, you know, they could have really done so much with exposing us to the universe of um, the Federation. I mean, they're the flagship, so they're going to visit all these worlds, but they don't go to very many member worlds. They always go to these one time alien worlds that we never see them again. And what they did to the trill was really disappointing. They invented the trill. Yeah, I know, but they made it seem like this trans bait and switch plot that is just did not age well. Um, oh, we got a bad trans story coming up this season, too. Oh, no. Yeah. Hey, there's the model. He was able to uh, carry it back to his quarters by Are himself. People- That's a really fun toy. Oh, totally. I used to have a set like that. Killer platforms. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would have sold that would have sold a bunch. I don't know why it wasn't ever marketed. Like well, during like stamp on it. During this show, um, you could or not during the show, but like back in the 90s, they had uh, a constructing a constructor like set where you could have these little blue plastic I beams and they look like construction beams from a building. And you could connect them in whatever way you wanted. And you could build these really tall structures and, and you could put facades on the side. They came little plastic facades. You could snap on to make your own building. Oh, and the kid just was not having it. He hates it. That's a good response of a child right there. Yeah. But it's also, it's also good for It's also a good learning experience for data. And it's, it's sort of shows that like, he's able to, you know, build, build, you know, what looks like empathy, which he was not really able to do with uh, the woman that he was dating. Mm. And that was more because he was like, I have to create a program that makes it like, I, I got to interrupt you. This kid is stupid. Did you see yeah. what he just did there? He tried to put the <laughs> the roof on that's totally unbalanced with one pillar. I mean, even watching that as a kid, I'm just like, really? Really? That's the best he could do? 
He's not stupid. He's stressed. <laughs> I guess. I just thought that was bad kid acting. I, yeah. I know we've covered this a couple of times. I was never re- a real fan when kids came on the show because they seem so unrelatable to me. Yes. That made any sense. But here's data is uh, magic here. He's building this thing super fast. I wish we'd gotten some flight of the bumblebee or, you know, uh, what's the Mozart one that's done. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, yes, yes. I know the one you're talking about. That was actually in one of the early episodes. Uh, the one where they go beyond space into bubble land. Yeah. And we get to see Captain Picard's grandmama, I believe. Wrong there. I hope you can't hear my heater turning on. No, no, I can't. I just built a new PC, so I'm wondering if the fan noise is come gonna come through on the mic. I don't hear it on my end, so probably not. Woohoo! So this is where the kid kind of decides that he's going to start emulating data. And again, it plays into that darker idea that he he has survivor's guilt. Especially because he thinks it's his fault that everybody on that ship died. I love the hallways of the ship. They're so great. But why is this kid by himself in quarters? Shouldn't he be staying with somebody? Sometimes you gotta be honest, you gotta be on your own. I think that would have been that would have been an interesting discussion to see is hey, let's put this kid in his own room and he can, I mean, Data's his, um, kind of his contact on the ship. It would have been interesting to see if it was like, you know, you can get in touch with, you know, with Data or with Troy by doing this. I would have honestly, because they had to add the, the thing that Troy can't read him, Mm-hmm. Just have Troy not even be in the episode and have it be Crusher that sets data up with trying to help the kid. It's conference time. Everything is solved with the conference. It's conference time. It's conference time. We could have had an email instead of this conference. I know. <laughs> Well, that phrase, did you get the memo, is kind of dead nowadays. Yeah. So I'm glad they didn't go too far into that. Well, I wonder, I wonder uh, what happened with Mr. Timothy, if we ever heard of him uh, again in the, uh, in the Star Trek universe. I mean, he'd be the right age to be um, an ensign on lower decks but he's not in he's not really in starfleet i love that he has replicated himself a sort of starfleet looking uniform Troy's a little surprised happy about this like okay i'll go with this let me see let me see what what you're doing with your world here i think if he was the if he acted totally the same every time she saw him it would be really frustrating but he's going through he's actually going through stages which is important when you know you're hit with that the level of grief that he's hit with i love how they wear green houndstooth uniforms absolutely love it the 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 most hideous jumpsuits in the show it's bad they don't still have them on uh on lower decks i don't think if you notice too, they've got this really tight fitting leather belt that goes around their waist too. It looks like it's about four inches wide. He gets to have some uh, some sweets, even though he's an android. So this this young man here who's playing Timothy, his name's John Joshua Harris. He is one year older than me. Crazy. I know. And it's funny because when I watch this episode, I always assume that the kids are younger than me, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Like, I I just assume that the children are just a little younger than myself. But actually, this was not the case here. He was a year older. 
Alexander was born in the same year as me and um, the Kirsten Dunst is coming up this season as well. Mm. And she is the same age as me. Here's why you know this kid. He was on Dallas from 1985 to 1991. Means he was super little. Yep. Anyway, it's wrapped up in that previous years because ah, 11, 10, 11 years old. Just the right age for watching Star Trek The Next Generation. Oh, yes. He's done a he lot was- of TV. He was in the Twilight Zone. Wow. And going so- back to talk to you about my, ne- my eight-year-old nephew, yes. this would have been a fine episode to introduce him to the show with. I would agree with you on that one. He would have, he would have found it fun, the idea of copying android and and all little boys want to be a robot so i don't know i was a robot for a couple of halloweens i don't think i was ever a robot for halloween i did like those uh those things that looked like tin cans but they had like an elbow joint to them mm-hmm. i always put them up my arm over my yeah, elbow the um the uh what you call it the dryer vent yeah and there we just talked over a, a kind of funny little skit where Timothy's doing these really random left, right head movements and data saying, hey, I'm not aware that I do this. And while he's saying this, he's moving his head back and forth. So it's sure. a nice little nod. And it's yeah. a good with non-neurotypical people where if you point out something that they do that they're not aware of, well, anybody, you never know how you're perceived by other people. I find it interesting that Data had to stop and look at the mirror to check his hair while uh, before continuing to work on Timothy's hair. You'd think he'd be aware of uh, what his what his style and look is. You got too much product in your hair, Timmy. If you're going to put any more in there, you need to join a college jam band. Here's the really crazy thing. If I apply pressure here, 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 and here, I could lift the cap of your skull off your head, just like my mind lifts off and not do any damage to you. Don't ask me how I learned it, kid. Yep. This kid was in Twin Peaks. Was he? Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to have to look him up after we record. I wonder because... if he was the My Grandson Knows Magic kid. Ooh, I don't know. See, that whole movie was, or that whole TV series was just really strange. Did you see the uh, wrap up series for it? Mm-mm. No. Oh, it was great. So here we go. We're painting on pre printed. So their art department just made a couple of prints for them to, to dab finishing touches on. Whoa. There's some energy there. Yeah. Trauma work, anybody? I really like this this sequence because this kid is just in emulating an android is just like gone until he, you know, just kept going and going and going until he was so exhausted that he just stopped. Mm-hmm. Just like kind of like a dog. Although I do know one person, actually instead of a roommate, that would do that. Where he would like come home and be like and literally he would shut off on off on off yeah we've have, got a mutual friend like that as well <laughs> data's yawning it looks like he's trying to kiss the air with an open mouth <laughs> oh i want to i want to see a yodeling data we haven't seen that yet. I bet you that dude could yodel. Yeah, that'll come about around whenever they decide they're going to make um, Data a CGI character, which would not be hard to do because we have so many files of Brent Spiner. Why they didn't go CGI in Picard is beyond me. They could have totally easily done it. I think because Brent Spiner didn't want to. I think he has some ownership of the character. and He was like, as long as I'm going to be here, I might as well do that he also you know look he was older and fatter in the movies too true true
Oh, he's out. Look at that. Paint a mustache on his lip. Do it. Oh, and he changed his mind. He thought about it. I could see it in his face. Shall I draw a mustache on this child? His like, parents are dead. Nobody's going to teach him this stuff. When you were saying that about him just being by himself, it would have pro- it would have been more prudent if he hadn't like fallen for data for him to stay with like the O'Briens or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, I just had a wicked idea. So instead of data rescuing Timothy, it was Riker. And then Riker could start doing these really weird parenting things like he did with his fake alien son from the previous season. Yeah. Uh, where he's like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to play this trombone. And here's your, and, and here's your fake uh, new mother here, Minuet. <laughs> and show that he never fully recovered from his trauma. It's like, yeah, I know you got a tough kid. I thought I had a family. Yeah, but he also would have gotten mad at him when he said when he's finally said what it was that happened to the ship. Oh yeah, because totally. he's in he's in a fairly affirming environment when he does say that he thinks it's his fault what happened to the ship. Riker would have been like, "You can't break a ship by hitting a panel. It's not possible." He yeah, like, he he kind of lacks that empathy. Okay, B plots kicking in. They feel uh, impact waves. Hitting the ship, they're not really sure what's going on. Yeah, they stuck in there. I don't know why I suddenly have your mean one, Mr. Grinch, in my head, but <laughs> you're a mean one, Mr. Wharf. <laughs> your photons are appeal. Your phasers are rusty. Your targ is a little short, Mr. Wolf. My phasers are not rusty. <laughs> I could see Data with the emotion ship doing that. Mm-hmm. Dancing all around him. I like the, the foreign language scripts on the wall. Like I said, the little details. It is strange, though, that how all these classrooms have the observation lounge. They they had that in the child, too, if you remember. Well, you'd have it, but you wouldn't have it be apparent that it was there. You'd have it so parents could observe and, you know, so so that Troy could have Troy could observe and stuff. Troy would be more of a presence of the school where. Because in real life, if you do if you do it this way, it would single kids out even more. Like, oh, he's somebody that Troy's watching. We better stay away from him. <laughs> but she would, she would, if she was good at her job, she would kind of always be there and talk to all of the kids frequently. Well, this is a, a question for military brats out there, and I wish Jim was on this recording. Is that well, when a new kid shows up, and you know they're just going to be around for a few weeks, how does? How does the school usually treat that stranger kid? Yeah, the, the one we got to get Jem back for is uh, the first duty, which is also this season. Mm-hmm. This is where Data, he can eat and drink. Yeah. I always forget about this. Oh. He's telling a child that he can't eat ice cream. Yeah. Can you think of anything more depressing? Makes me think of uh, AI where the robot has the spinach eating contest with his brother and they have to vacuum out his chest cavity. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Spinach is for little boys and Popeye. So data makes it clear that he will never grow. He will never change. Which isn't, which isn't true. And Sun has told him that. And Sun has told him as much. And he's kind of surrounded by people that believe that he will grow and change. He's grown and changed since the first season. He's not yeah. as, lit- as literal anymore. The biggest problem when we've talked about this is that he would have learned a lot of the stuff that he learns from his crewmates on the Enterprise 
in previous postings and at the Academy. He really does kind of come into the show as though he were born yesterday, but then you have like his backstory of like, well, you know, I had to put in all these hours on different ships to you know get this rank of Lieutenant Commander. And it would have been harder for him too, because it's like, yeah, you promote the android that knows everything over the the, you know, the actual flesh and blood creature. You well, know. you have to but, ask yourself in in an environment like the Federation, specifically Starfleet, where you have different cultures and different ways that people socialize, are soft skills a requirement in your career advancement? I don't know. I mean, data can, I, I think someone who was born yesterday, you know, to use your expression, could be promoted to second in command of the ship if they were able to demonstrate that they could meet the bare minimum skills. Because if you look at it now, you'd want your leaders to be charismatic and validating and they want to emotionally support the people around them. Well, data doesn't do that. He's just kind of there and tells people what to do. Yet he's the what third most senior person on the ship. Yep. But then you have your guys like on Deep Space Nine, the super intelligent but totally non-socially skilled folks that basically have to live in an institution. <laughs> yes, very true. Now they're shooting into space, and the the laser beam phaser. Phaser beam is being beautifully refracted. The laser phaser. Lasers. The loser doozer. So Picard is now starting to think that this phenomena uh, is either maybe he's probably sussing out this is not an attack. Because he called it a phenomena. Phenomena. Yeah. Phenomena. Do, 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 do. Phenomena. So Jordy's little story of the fire in his childhood, originally they were going to um, use that as a, a potential telepathic memory invasion for the episode Violations. Oh, huh. that would have been scary. That episode, I just rewatched it today. I remember not liking that at all the first time I watched it, but except hmm. for the ending, I really liked it on this rewatch. Interesting. I'll have to pick your brain when we record it. We were attacked. We were attacked. Oh, here we go. Here's your validating environment. Yep. Everybody's standing to the side or behind him, kneeling at his level. And he is saying that he did it. Now, because this is Star Trek, the first thing you might want to ask yourself as Picard is, are you a baby Q? Are you a telepathic monster baby? Um, it's like you have to eliminate all the absurd as long right along with the real. Oh, look at that cry. That was a break to commercial where he said that he had done this. That he killed them all. Oh, there it is. It, his arm hit the communi uh, computer panel and the ship was destroyed. You know, this kid is never going to want to interact with technology ever again. That's true, but the world still needs Luddites. Uh, he'll be that potato farmer where everybody wants real homegrown organic potatoes and not... He can marry, he can marry a Vulcan woman and... Raise <laughs> props. Yep. It is logical for you to plow the field. The seed is fertile. I don't like how they resolved his feelings here in what 30 a 30 second scene, a minute long no, scene. He would, need, he would need more than just this. I mean, this would have been a good turning point. But it's like the next time we see our well, he has to. He has to remember everything that was said about what they did to make the ship blow up, 
which is super hard. Yeah. But he well, gets through it's like well, let's 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 just sit and sing row, row, row your boat. <laughs> well, I do have to say that um they did not properly debrief this child. Uh they would have said, okay, tell us some of the things that you heard that you saw um that you smelled like they'd want to have they want to try to get as much as they can from this kid um but he's totally underutilized at least he's sitting right there on the uh on the bridge with data and he gives them the magic clue of more more shields more shields but yeah this is one of those where the kid is right and they don't listen until yeah. the last possible moment at least Picard is learned not to tell him to shut up. <laughs> but it's data that's got to do the whole, yeah, you gotta love, you gotta drop the shields. And it's tough because Riker does the right thing. He's like, no, we can't do that. We'll get um, so yeah, because we'll get destroyed. Well, this this right essentially, here essentially orders Picard when the safe thing to do would be to order Worf to do it, not to order Picard to give the order. Because mm. he is technically Worf's superior officer. Yeah, I and guess Worf, he is. Worf can't, uh, Worf can't do anything that Riker says that he can't do. But still, Data should have, Data should have given the order to Worf, not ordered Picard not to. Or ordered Picard to give the order. Yeah, well, it doesn't may not look good for from tele uh, for television for him to just kind of turn around and kneel on the back of his chair at the science stations yeah. and go, "Yep, Worf, go ahead and drop them shields." I I but do want to. How fun is this? What this kid kid gets to do? Because few of the few of the kids that come on here get to like be on the bridge and like interact with all of the stuff. Oh, and the kid has to learn how to fake move too. Yeah, and he can't and he can't look like he's having fun at all. He's got to he's got to, to do this whole deadly serious thing. Mm-hmm. That is a that is a pucker moment there on Picard's face. He looks so surprised. No, I do want to say something that that is clear here. So even though I, I say I don't like children episodes too much in Star Trek, one thing is always true is that someone comes through advocates for the kid when nobody else is listening and really basically says that the kid is right that he's validated yeah. and if, if data wasn't there to listen to timothy they would have been killed yeah um, and and mr uh you know mr uh Riker here would have would have uh if they followed his suggestion they, they would have been toast and this is something so that I needed as a child back then was validation. Mm -hmm. And I could often see myself on the enterprise with the crew. And then whatever problem I had, someone would kind of do this deep dive forensics guess and validate whatever issue I've got going on. And this, and that was the other thing is that he also, if he, if he, if he not, not, not even if, he felt like he destroyed a, sh a ship and now he knows he's responsible for saving one. Yes. Which is great therapy. Yeah. So Troy did no work whatsoever in this episode. Other than to make sure that, that data and, and Timothy st stuck together. Oh. He didn't push that. I think they should have come out from the beginning that, that uh, Timothy was obviously lying about the destruction of the ship and for them to spend about 20 minutes trying to figure out the lie. And it's like, okay, what's true and what was part of the lie and kind of help process the agony of being responsible for killing your parents. Um, that would have been much more powerful than the one minute briefing room conversation or Picard's ready room conversation of, yes, I did it. I killed them. Uh, and then even for Timothy to give the clues, yes, that's right, more shields. Like if they had introduced some of the earlier um, wave front effects earlier, kind of push that back, they could help explain what's going on. Um, they didn't give enough room for solving the mystery, unfortunately. So there's a, 
a college humor show called Zach Morris's Trash, mm-hmm. where they go through an episode of Saved by the Bell and explain how like Zach ruined somebody's life. Oh, and then like what you know what was sort of done to redeem Zach with this character, and then and that's like, and so this character is okay. And we never see them again. They <laughs> probably killed themselves. Oh, <laughs> which is oh. kind of what I feel about Timothy at the end of this. And yes. so Jada says that they're friends, and we never see Timothy again because he probably killed himself. There's her name, Sheila Franklin. Yes. Oh, that was that was a fun episode. It was, was kind of. Yeah. It's kind of a snoozer, but you know what? What you just said there, Patrick, really got me thinking is you round up all of the collateral damage characters and put them together in one room and talk about their life altering encounter with the enterprise and how their lives just were either torn apart or pieced together because of this damn ship. (laughs) Oh, well, it could be like a lower decks where they stroll into a bar of of all the survivors of the enterprise and their missions and <laughs> they're just kind of railing uh it's almost kind of like that um that uh the the time train on rick and morty if you remember that one yes where it's going around in infinite loops and everybody's asking or talking about reminiscing about their times that they interacted with rick sanchez and Speaking of, have you watched the show Infinity Train? No, I have not. What's it all about? It's really good. Oh, yeah? What's the premise? Or is it just a train that goes in circles? Long pause. Oh, no. It's, um... <laughs> so it's a tra- yeah, it's a train that is quite long. And each car is like a different environment. But it's a it's a rec- it's a show about reconciliation. Huh. So basically, something happens in your life, like out in the world, and the train shows up, and you get on it, and you have to solve, you know, whatever your problem is. And you're given like oh. a, you're giving a you have a number printed on your hand, and you have to make the number go down to zero to be able to get off the train. And uh, Kate Mulgrew is a voice on the show. No. That's yeah. great. You know, that reminds me of an Adventure Time episode where they find this train just going in circles and each yep. in each uh, cabin is a different villain they have to, uh, to uh, vest, I guess. Well, we are totally getting off track. Let's give this episode our review. I would say it's a good three out of five. Um, I, I never really liked the psychological process work of this show. Um, Troy could always do a better job. I think they could have done a better job tying the action sequences in with the therapy to help kind of liven things up in the in the trauma processing side of the world. Um, that And it makes for good television when someone starts having flashbacks and freaking out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's it for me. Three out of five. How about you, Pat? I'll give it three and a half. Three it's and a half. good intro to who all the characters are. Jordy gets some good speeches. Uh, Data does some good stuff. You see Picard, Picarding, Riker, Rikering. Um, I guess Worf is really the only Worf and Crusher are the only ones that get short shrift in it. Uh, but yeah, I I think it's better than I probably thought it was when I was a kid. This was an easy week for. Gates and Michael. All they had to do is show up for their one or two scenes and have the rest of the week off. All right, folks. Well, that that concludes our episode for today. So make sure to catch us for our next episode. What is it? Uh, violations? Violations. Where they Ooh. take things a little too far. Oh, yes. Very true. All right, folks, with that, have a wonderful day. Music provided by lofigirl.com. Artists include Tenno, Daydreaming, BVG in Mondberg, Insomnia, WYS, Snowman, Be Common Banks, Because, Episode Cover Art, 
created by Matthew Kirshner. Podcast logo and main cover art provided by David Clawwitter. Audio engineering done by Sasha Shoudies. <laughs>